Okay. <laughs> All righty. Good evening, folks, and welcome to another GTA Lug. Uh, today we have David Collier Brown speaking on testing tools uh, for load testing servers. So I'm really pleased to have him. David, it's all yours. Okay. So you may know how the how this got its name from our from our uh, uh, email list. I asked this community and and uh, you you for a name for a replay test that people would actually realize was a replay test. The answer was, replay it again, Sam. Now the actual movie line is not play it again, Sam. Ilsa says, play it once, Sam, for old time's sake. And Rick goes, play it. <laughs> but, the line, but the line is, Memorable. Now, there's all sorts of ways to do load testing, and the old way was painful. You invent a synthetic test that, some little benchmarky thing that actually is supposed to represent what you're doing, and then you go and you buy some license from somebody. And HP Load Runner was really popular. It worked well as long as you bought enough licenses. But if you didn't, it gave you an amazing wrong answer. It told you your performance was fine when it was awful. Because you couldn't raise the load high enough. <laughs> and if you blew the algorithm that you used for your test, then you had a really good load test that didn't measure what you do. Well, part of that we got rid of with, with free software. Switch to JMeter. It's free. It's good. Every single time I use it, it's better. It's still idiosyncratic. It's still a little odd. And you need something that's a real script of what you do. Now, back when it was painful, the Samba team did it better. They took a log of a real production site on a fast as hell machine with debug on real high. So they got every single operation, every request, every store, every time they took a, a, a lock and an op lock, beautiful. And then they manually groveled over it until they could produce the script, which you feed to a program called SMB Torture at 1x, for example, and that gives you a nice, perfectly reasonable load and put some moderate stress on the machine, and if you want to see if you can handle a few more users, 2x, maybe 10x. And you know, up until the point where it falls in the heap. But laboriously is not my middle name. Miss the click is my middle name. There's the click. Everybody and their brother is doing stuff with REST. So I'm working on a particular storage product. How many web servers, embedded web servers, do you think it has? <laughs> There's the one in the C Sharp program. There's one in the S3 interface. And there's another one in Ceph itself. <laughs> Every single one of them generates one line per request in a standard web format that everybody pretty much uses. It's the same format as, as Apache. So there's the person who called, there's the date and time, time is important, there's the get and the thing that it got, and results are pretty important. That was, a, that was a success. Not everybody bothers to say how many bytes there were or whether it was a success or not, but mostly they have that. And for the two web servers I use a lot, which are Apache and Nginx, preferably Apache, Nginx is weird in some ways, you can get the response time with a variable. It collects it, so you might as well log it. I use a particular format that is a variation on an old standard. The standard part is there is a time, and there are values for latency, response time, time in between requests, called think time, and bytes. Everything else is optional. I use that format because it's, I, and I just locked the other program into this format. 
I use that because it's also the format that I write as a log. So I can compare, oh, I got 200 here, I got a 444 there. That's not right. It took two, two milliseconds uh, in one case, 18 milliseconds in another. Oh, I don't think that's too good. So that it's, I can compare like with like. And if I've got a run from a real system, I can replay it and go like, oh, yeah, I've, I've improved by 10, 15%. I got a run from before in a development in environment. I replay it. I said, oh, uh oh, my latest release is about six or eight percent slower than my previous release. What did I do? I didn't optimize it, I'll tell you that. The program itself is called Play It Again Sam, but the command line command is just run load test. It says, do a rest test at 80 TPS for, uh, for 80 records read out of this log and send it to that IP address. And then tee that to a, to a file. And then it's going to look, look pretty much like my input did. Now, At that point, I got uh, this far. I went the wrong direction. Goodness gracious. Oops. OK, so that's the background to it. The code is relatively simple. This is yet another Go program. This is a replacement for a C program that I wrote originally. And it's just a pipeline. So you write your input to a pipe. You start consumers of that pipe. When I'm doing an increasing load test, I start another 10 every 10 seconds. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, go, so on. And each of the consumers does very little more than do a get or do a put, time it, throw away the results, throw away the data. It's surprisingly simple. There's read the work from the file, reads from this file from a particular point to a particular point and writes it to a pipe. So I say select from this input file starting at record 10,000 to 20,000, write it to the pipe. The pipe goes into generate load. I put in the TPS target. A progress rate if I'm stepping it up by pins. I start TPS and the URL that I'm actually going to beat on. That writes to a pipe called Alive, and then this loop runs. This is a select, a select or a poll in Unix. If it reads something from Alive, then oh, it processed another another record, so increment process. If it doesn't read from Alive. If there's nothing there for it to read, it falls into here. Oh, this is a timer. So this timer says, wait, timeout seconds, which happens to be 35 seconds. If it waits 35 seconds, it fires off and says, OK, I'm done. Print out that. Print no activity after 35 seconds. I'm holding normally and returns. The only thing that's interesting here is that I built the pipe so that its output goes to the main routine. So the main routine is the one that receives everything. It is the last one that exits. And so these guys wait until this guy is done before they, before they leave. That's fairly important. If you build it the other way around with the main routine writing to a Go routine that writes to another Go routine that writes to another Go routine, and then the main routine exits, so does everybody. <laughs> that can be a little surprising. I was embarrassed. That was about the second thing I learned about Go. It blows. You know, the way I wrote it, it just blew up. Hmm. Here's how I increase the load. This 
for statement uses a timer. So it goes or it iterates across the entire range of a timer. And the timer goes off a certain number off every certain number of seconds. It happens to be 10 seconds. So each 10 seconds, it increases the rate by the progress rate. If it's done, it falls out. And it increases the number of workers by the amount that I told it to increase. So by 10, for example. And it prints out, now it's so many requests a second. So every 10 seconds, tick, 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 until it gets to the maximum, says, OK, maximum rate breaks out, waits that long, close, closes a pipe called closed, and exits. A worker is nothing but a guy that reads the pipe and does another loop of exactly the same sort. Every second, it sees if it's been told to close down. And if it hasn't, it does work. It reads R from the pipe, and it spins off a subroutine to, to do the get. This is a go routine. It runs to completion. It does a timed operation, exits. So all in all, it's extremely succinct and uh, sort of like way fewer for loops than my original C program. Nice computer. Okay. So that's what it does, but what do you do with it? Hmm. Well, A load testing exercise is not just one successful test. First of all, you have to get the load generator to work correctly. Secondly, you have to get the target system to work correctly. Thirdly, you got to get the network. And then you got to look at the results and make sure that you've done something interesting. So the actual sequence that I use is I, I first do a simple test. I run it in verbose for, for one instruction. Uh, and if the response isn't a 2, 200, 202, 204, whatever, it's going to give me an explanation of what the other end did. This looks like that. This is a failure. There's the record that says such, you know, such and such happens, and it expected a 200, but it got a 444. 444 is actually an Nginx specific return code that means I got an EOF in the middle of a call. And in there's the error message. Error getting HTTP response. And I put print out the get. And then at this point, you get the normal message from the, uh, from the underlying Linux library that says dial CP. Bleh! get socket op, connection refused. That's, that tells me that there's nothing there at the other end. And it prints out a little bit of interesting information for me to use to debug it, the get, the key, HTTP1, where I sent it, 5280, user agent, cache, no cache, gzip allowed, and I got a nil response and a nil body. So there was nobody there. A successful call looks a little bit little better. It says there's the request to another different machine, Calvin. Here's the response headers, status code, 200 OK, and the contents, and then eventually the body, which happened to be a GIF, so it's not exactly intelligible on this screen. So now I've got the target machine behaving correctly. The next thing I need to do is validate my data and my load generator to make sure that it's correct. Remember, I've, cut, I've captured this from a log, and it may contain some garbage. And in fact, it often does contain some garbage. 
So I run through the whole file of the data file that I have at some moderate speed. If 100 TPS is reasonable, OK, so fair enough, 100, with the option to crash. So anytime it has an error, it's going to stop. And it will stop, and I will see what the line was that was in my data file, and I'll fix my data file. And sometimes I'll prune bunches of things out of the data file. And sometimes I'll go like, hmm, that doesn't make any sense. That should work. <laughs> and look at what the, what the target machine is actually doing with curl, whatever. Uh, once I've got a valid file, I know I can now do a real test. It's not just going to go something, do something silly in the middle. The way the test normally runs is it runs from beginning to end, and it ignores almost everything. and just reports if there's an error. When I'm trying to clean, it, clean up my data, I have an explicit express option, make it crash. And of course, every time you get something that is not normal, the verbose switch is automatically on, and you get information about what didn't work. At that point, you actually do a load test. Say, let's say the system handles 10 transactions a second, target. So you go from t 1 to 15 or 20 by 1s or 2s, stepping it up each 10, 10 seconds. And that, I'm going to I, what, which I will show you in a second, will give you a curve that starts off horizontally, rises very gently, a little slower, a little slower, a little slower. Oh, then it gets re slow really fast. Response time goes higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. It's slower and slower and slower. So, demo. Now, let's bring up. I need two terminals. There we go. All right. And I need a couple of terminals. Just local host make file. And here's how I actually run it is with a make file, and the first one is that example where I said debug on TPS141. And in another window, and this will take me a second or two, I will run a load sync so I can beat this poor machine up uh, right here. Uh, this is another program named based on comments from my colleagues. Simul aqua is Latin for when you get there. <laughs> when it's done. I'll just shrink this down a little. So you can see the bottom bar, and I will run it. And this is nothing but a but a trivial uh, program which reads input and says success and, re and reports its time. Compiling. Hmm. 
This goes much faster when I plugged into the 110. I wonder why. There. Yep, exactly. All right, so it started up, and I'll go through the sequence that, that I mentioned. Okay, probe. Started, did one record, printed out, success, 200 OK. Reported how long it took. The first value here is the response time, how long the request came, took to go and come back. The second is how long it took to get any additional packets. There was one additional packet. I'm not sure why. Number of bytes and, of course, what I requested. So that worked. Here's what I do to do a test between uh, 2 and 24 TPS. Can everybody see that? Because it's right at the bottom of the screen. I'll move it up. So it's a rest call. Target TPS is 24. It's going to progress by 2s. Uh, and it's going to go to that same machine. So control P. It starts off at two requests a second. And I'll shrink this down and that then to four. And you can see in the other window that, it's, that it is, is uh, getting stuff back. Six. And so on, stepping up every 10 seconds, it bumps that up by another 10 TPS. 8, 10, 12, so on and so forth. Control C. It generates a file called, uh, in that particular case, raw.csv. And ods, which I've previously captured and stuck it in a, in a spreadsheet. And what it tells you is how this session looked from beginning to end. How oh, very interesting. Oh, sigh. Just go back to A. Go back to A? Well, if you notice, you're at P over there. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm off screen. Yeah. I'm trying to grab a hold of the... the, the uh, I'm not sure about XFCE, but in some window managers, you can drag the little icony things in the desktop view in the top bar. Mm, yes, good thought. Oh, well, I guess I cannot. That is annoying. All right. So that's the end of the demo, and I will just bail out of that and go back here. Oh, sorry. Settings. Display. A mirror. Swap them around. Apply. And in a moment, close. So. What I've got originally was a sequence of records. What I, ran, what I did to reduce them was I ran them through a script called perf to seconds And for each second in this date field, I rolled them all up 
and average the latency. So, for example, this, this was at 6 TPS, then it switched to, to 9 for a number of, number of seconds, then 13, 9, 15, 19, as it stepped up. Now, in a spreadsheet, you can take that and plot it as an XY graph. You take the, the uh, number of TPS and make that X. You take the response time, make that Y, and plot it as a scattergram. This is the disk on my machine. And at uh, low loads, it's down around zero seconds. When I get to a ridiculous overload, it starts increasing in a straight line. Uh, if you've seen some of my older talks, this, this is the hockey stick curve. It goes off mostly level for a long period of time and then goes sky high. In this particular case, that disk is brutally overloaded at 250 requests a second. It's not designed for that. In fact, the range that this particular disk is good at is maybe up to 100. If I plot that part of the graph, I get a nice straight line. It's a very, very shallow curve. It's a hyperbola, so it starts off like a straight line, takes a curve, and then ends up like a straight line. And so if I needed to always get 40 TPS out of a system, all I have to do is say, all right, sorry, if I always need something like 0 0.4 seconds response time. If I have to be faster than 0 0.04 seconds, I can look at that and read it off and say, well, that's 40 TPS. If I need 80 TPS, I need two disks. If I need 120 TPS, I need four disks. And the, the takeaway from that is it's not how fast it is. The, fast, the fastness of a, of a system is, is the, the angle of this gentle line. It's how many of the things you can get running in parallel that really affects performance. So a 50% faster CPU is nothing like as good as two CPUs of the original speed, assuming your program at least to some degree parallelizes. If it only can use one CPU period, well, too bad. So in the low range, it's linear. It's reasonably quick. At normal overloads, at the kind of like, oops, I double, I double the load that I planned to hit, it's still pretty good. Nothing to write home about. It doesn't fall in a, in a hole until 250 TPS, which is ridiculously past anything I'm, going to, I'm, I'm likely to get to. If I wanted to build an array of those disks, then uh, basically with that one, one diagram, um, one good test, I know what I need. If, I, if I'm trying to build a, a, a CPU server, a compute server, trying to build a database server, uh, all I really need to know is what's the, what's the good flat area before it tries to turn up. 80% of something is where it tends to turn up. In this case, 80% uh, of the, the time. that you apply to your problems. So it's the number of devices, number of CPUs, number of disks that you have that's going to be the dominating cost uh, when you're trying to get more performance. Go for the next 30%, 30% faster CPU, that's not going to buy a lot, and it's going to cost you a dollar or three. Uh, the gotcha is that not everything scales horizontally like that. Some things are inherently single-threaded. Some things interact with each other in such a way that you can only run maybe six or eight instances of it before it gets, starts tripping over its own feet. Anything that's got locks in it trips over its own feet a lot. And that is the the useful bit of information there. Uh, now, 
If you want to apply this to your own work, uh, it's on github.com. There's a tutorial there on running record replay tests uh, in MD. Uh, on my blog at leafless.ca, there's uh, a, a bit more related information. And being really, really old fashioned, I wrote man pages for each of these things. So you could look up what the options are and what, you know, what, what you couldn't remember me, what I'd said about. <sighs> so, um, my God, <sighs> that took me, that took me 50 minutes at home. <sighs> Questions, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, set this so that you can figure out what is the limiting mega hardware? Like in this particular case, it's quite obvious it's the disk. But yeah. is it? Is there any way to specifically tell? Oh, we're maxing the CPU, or we're maxing memory, or disk, or or, or is this just we run this test and? basically hope we get the right numbers. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what you tend to do is notice uh, one of three things gets exhausted. Uh, for if you count networking. So if you're running SAR or any of the performance reporting uh, programs at the same time as you're running this load generator, it steps up. Uh, I, I tend to run Grafana and have a, a whole bunch of windows open with a whole bunch of graphs going on. So if I'm going to ex if it's something that's going to exhaust the CPU, I'm going to I'm going to see it run out first and then everything is just going to, going to flatten off. My load won't increase anymore. It'll get up to like 200 and stop because I've run out of, out of CPU. If it's something that I'm not also consuming, if it's something like disk, it's going to go up to a certain point it will start slowing down. You'll see the disk times. Uh, if you not not all of the re tools report service time and uh, uh, and transfer time from the disk, but some of them do. And you see the disk times suddenly go sky high. You know at that point you've saturated the disk. Uh, memory memory is a little trickier. You'll see it, see it rise, but it tends you know. Programs tend to expand to fill all available memory in any case. But what you will see is if you've allocated swap, all of a sudden you'll see disk activity on the swap partition jumps up because it, it now has a resident set size that is bigger than your memory. Therefore, it's trying to grab space off disk and page stuff out. And the world suddenly slows down uh, as, as memory IO, as Basically, swap partition I/O jumps up. If you've got memory in a, so if, you, if your swap is just a file on your main file system, it'll be a, a sudden a sudden step upwards in file system activity on that disk. Yeah. So the, the those resources, networking, uh, you you get up to a certain point, and you you see now networking is a lot. Networking will clip itself to keep from over from overstressing. But you'll see, see uh, network usage climbing up and then level off. And it shouldn't, shouldn't level off <laughs> because you're adding more load. So when it, as, soon as, uh, as soon as networking levels off, you know you've exceeded the effective throughput of the network. If the problem is you can only do so many transactions per second, your actual limitation will be how fast is the disk spinning. You can only commit once for each spin of the disk. Yes. And so the I.O. level will in some respects not be very high. You're not writing mm -hmm. all that much to the mm -hmm. disk. So I'm, it, I'm not sure what that case looks yeah, like in yeah. practice. You would have, have to actually look at start I.O.s. Uh, so you look at the number of I.O. operations issued to the disk, and it will suddenly level off. It will hit it. Basically, the classic database or time-sharing server uh, I.O. pattern on a disk 
is seek read, seek read, seek read, seek read, or seek write, seek write, seek write. Uh, and, and so in the case of a database that has got a part, has got a journal, you'll see sort of steady journal writes, but you'll see the writes to the, the your data disk level off at a certain point. It's, that one is harder to see. What's easier, the one that's the hardest to see is locks. So unless the database itself tells you what kind of locking it uses and has a metric to allow you to look at it, or uses some, uh, which is, and this is unusual, uses one of the system provided locking things and, and you use SAR to find it. Uh, you don't see what happens. You see the locks rise up to a certain level and the level off. All your normal statistics look perfectly normal. It just goes, goes to crap. <laughs> What it's doing, yes. Okay, you brought this up before, but what is the problem with false positives that you're going to get here? Like, I'm thinking specifically where you're going to be caching like data that you've got from the disk in memory. Yeah. Because you're just basically asking for it, the same thing over and over again, it won't go to the disk all the time. Yeah. Uh, that's why I've got a relatively large data file. So the data file hits a whole bunch of individual f files on disk and basically keeps my, my, my it never goes back and, and hits the same, di same uh, file twice uh, in, uh, in, with any rapidity unless the original data set did that as well. Uh, that's one of the things at work we were doing Kobo's uh, covers. And so one of my, one of my uh, data sets had a whole bunch of the most popular Kobo books. And so I went, oh, sort unique by the key, you know, the, that we identified it by, that gave me one of each, and then sort by time to put it back, in, back into random order again before I, before I could safely use it. Otherwise, I would have got exactly what you said and seen caching. There, uh, not shown in the in the demo was there is an option to, to turn HTTP cache on and off, and I normally have it off. So I set a caching header. I, I set a no cache header. I can turn that off, obviously, if I want to test the cache, and and I have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. David, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk tonight.